as far as quarterbacks go, Peyton Thorne is the winner of spring so far. You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby. And thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day. Join me as he does every single Monday. It is the Lindsey Crosby of AuburnDaily.com as well as a bunch of other places. We'll talk about Cam Coleman continues to be an absolute stud, an absolute freak throughout Auburn spring practices, including the scrimmage on Saturday. We'll also answer the question, is Auburn baseball okay? But first things first, we'll talk quarterbacks and Lindsey. Peyton Thorne seems to be dominating the quarterback battle. Putting together notes from all the message board posts that that Auburn media has put out there, as well as talking to some of my contacts and sources that were at the scrimmage on Saturday, Peyton Thorne appears to be by far the most productive quarterback on Auburn's roster. This is not me saying Peyton Thorne is an incredible quarterback. It's not me predicting that he's going to throw for 3,000 yards or anything like that. But as far as quarterback separation and a potential quarterback battle that we talked about all offseason, Peyton Thorne appears to be leading the way for Auburn's quarterback pecking order at this point of the year. And to me, that kind of makes sense, right? If you're yeah. looking at the situation that Peyton Thorne is in, a multi-year starter in Power 5, both Michigan State and Auburn, uh, compared to Hank Brown, who got, what, two drives in garbage time last year, compared to Holden Garner, who got like three plays and looked like a deer in the headlights, compared to Walker White, who was throwing against high schoolers a couple months ago. Like, it it makes sense that in this environment, the guy with a ton of experience, yeah, uh, familiarity, playing with these players, throwing to these players, that he would be doing the best. And I think really where I am is, is this different from what we expected to be hearing halfway through spring practice? Like, I, that's kind of, like you would automatically assume and hope that Peyton Thorne would be winning. I think the right. big question is, is he dominating more than we thought he would? Did we think it would be more of a competition? Or is this kind of what we expected from practice and we need to see what happens in a game? Because this is not a game. Not a game, Zach. You're talking about practice, man. Practice. Practice. Yeah. Not a game. Which is, I mean, I know I know you're making a joke there, but yeah. it is it is the big concern. Right. Right? It is, okay, can Peyton Thorne do things in a game that he didn't do last year? At Auburn, and we're all a broken record when we talk about this. Like the path to Peyton Thorne being more productive, like there is one, there is one, one natural progression uh, of him as an athlete. Two, he doesn't have to worry about transferring, and he's actually going through spring at the place where he's going to be playing football in the fall. And the situation around him is better. I believe it's easier to play quarterback this year for Auburn than it was last year. The receiving room is better. I think the offensive line is going to be better. The running backs are all coming back, so we assume that room will be better too. I mean, there, it, I, I think it's going to be easier for him to play quarterback than a year ago, but still, at some point, like he's got to take a big step. And as all of these surrounding pieces, all of these variables that this coaching staff has had control over and made more favorable to the quarterback position, is it going to be enough? And so far, it sounds like. It will be. Sounds like he threw a touchdown pass to Rivaldo Fairweather, which Love that. needs to happen a lot in 2024. If Auburn's going to need to win more games than they did a year ago, they need Rivaldo Fairweather to do that. And, and I don't want to get too much into Cam Coleman because we're going to talk about him a lot in the second segment. But there, there have been other guys in the receiver room. It sounds like it's Cam Coleman, and it sounds like it's Robert Lewis, maybe a little bit of Caleb Burton. And then there's a big drop-off. Lindsay, we'll talk about the receivers in a second. but. Peyton Thorne, I was told, had two touchdown drives. Hank Brown, I believe, had two touchdown drives. I think one of those was against the third team. But to me, it seems like it's those two guys. It's Peyton, then a drop-off, and then there's Hank. And then like I'm not hearing anything from folks that are at the scrimmage about Holden or Walker White, which is probably not a great thing. <laughs> the... Uh... 
Walker White, I get, right? Yeah, he's been here I mean, five minutes, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, he was, he was throwing against at Arkansas private schoolers a couple months ago. It, it makes sense. And yeah, some sure. of the reporting we heard from early in camp from, you know, uh, different people on here, message boards, things like that, were that he was in the deep end adjusting to the speed of the college game. You hear that all the time. And so I think Free said it. I think yeah. Hugh Free said that. Yeah. There you go. I knew it was something, something good there. And yeah. so like, like we're not too worried about Walker White at this point in spring, because if you had to get to Walker White on the field in 2024, things went really bad, right? But the Holden Garner thing, I think is, I'm not going to go out and say that was a missed evaluation or anything, but it feels like at this point in time in his career, you've had enough opportunity to adjust to the speed of the college game. And yes, the playbook has changed and all of that, but it's changed for all of them. And all of the law, like all of the, the praise we heard about the natural arm talent that he had as he's gone through practices now for two years. Yeah. The fact that he's still, like, you're just not hearing anything about him at all when he's been passed by Hank Brown tells me that I don't necessarily, like, I think if this is any sort of battle, which again, there's questions about that. Sure. It's solely down to two guys. And that Holden Gariner, at this point, it feels like he's probably not going to end up playing at Auburn unless something uh, goes wrong ahead of him. Well, it does feel like there was a battle for QB two, right? Like mm -hmm. I think that happened. I think there truly was a, a, a battle for the backup quarterback spot. And it seems like Hank Brown is, is winning that. And so to me, if Holden, if Holden leaves after spring and it's like, okay, it, it's QB one, QB two, QB three. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, you enter the portal or you you search the portal for another quarterback, are you aiming for a QB1? Are you aiming for a QB2? Are you aiming for just an older veteran guy that maybe wants to go into coaching afterwards and he can kind of help mentor some of these young guys? I don't know. That'll be a fascinating conversation if it happens. But you're right. I mean, the the Holden Gurner saga at Auburn is an interesting one. I mean, one is was one of the first guys to commit to Brian Harson. In fact, his his commitment kind of excited all of us. It's like, yeah, this is a guy who wants to play for Brian Harson. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. And then obviously, you know, that line sadly wasn't long, but. And that's gotten Gern smaller. <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't know how to fully feel about the Gurner thing. And I mean, we're, we're really going to dive into this conversation if he does enter the portal, but I don't know. Like, I think there's two sides of this coin, Lindsay. I think there's the side of, Auburn failed Holden Gurner because he should be better at this point than he was. But it's like you had to fire Harson, and then Hugh Freeze had to go out and get his own guys. And when Gurner was given a shot in games, like you said, he, he didn't look comfortable at all. But like, was that all on him? Was that the coaches? And it's just the, this change of offensive coordinator every single year. Did it, did it hurt him? Because he's the only quarterback in this room that Hugh Freeze did not recruit. He went out and got Thorne. He brought Hank with him as a Liberty commit over. And then obviously Walker White, you know, committed to, to Hugh Freeze early last cycle. So it's a different situation. But I'm, to me, it's like, it's not a fit. I don't know why he went through spring. There might be some academic stuff as far as maybe he's graduating. I, I'm not, I'm not privy to that information and it, it really doesn't matter. But I am a little surprised he is still here. I'm going to give him benefit of the doubt on the first year because that okay. staff was just garbage, right? Like, I don't think we can blame the players for anything that happened in that first season. But having now been here for a full season under a much better coaching staff that actually, you know, cares about the players and tries to win and all of that stuff, makes halftime adjustments, what a world. Uh, the fact that you still haven't heard much positive from him kind of tells me that there's something missing. And like you said, I don't want to speculate. I don't know what it is. But yeah, yeah kind of surprised he's here. Uh, it may have been something where he's like, okay, let me go through spring. Let me legitimately try to fight for the job. I do want to address real quick. I know we have to go. Uh, uh, you mentioned in the portal, do you try to find a number one guy? And I think we learned with Peyton Thorne what that looks like if you bring that guy in after spring. And so unless it's somebody who is an obvious and clear upgrade, which it feels like there's never many of those guys out there in the portal, yeah. you find a guy who can be depth, like you said, maybe the uh, the veteran who wants to be going into coaching, 
who can come in and help the room. And if you have to install him as the fourth quarterback and he's in a game because you've had a ton of injuries, he can hand the ball off really well. Yeah, or maybe it's the understanding he's the third quarterback this year. Maybe they want a redshirt walker for whatever reason, and it's like, okay, then he's out of eligibility or you know whatever, whatever the situation may be. And look, I'm fine with either option. Yeah. I'm fine with go out and get the best guy you can or get a guy that can kind of make the future of Auburn's quarterback situation better. I'm, I'm fine with either of those paths. But the Holden Gurner thing, to me, it, that really kind of, I think, was the turning point as far as fan expectation was that dang pro day a year ago where folks were like, he out through Cam Newton. And it's like, what are we doing? What are we doing here? So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to look back on the Holden Gurner era whenever that is done. And, hey, maybe it pans out. Maybe it turns out for him. I hope it does. I'm pulling for him. Seriously, I really am pulling for him. All right. We discuss quarterback separations. Peyton, Hank, Holden, and Walker right now. We'll see what happens moving forward. But as far as the wide receiver room goes, there is a guy and there is a massive drop off after that. We discuss in just a moment right here on Locked On Auburn. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Game Time. Download the Game Time app today. It's free. And look, Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. Want to go see the Braves? A lot of you guys are listening in Atlanta or watching in Atlanta. Lindsay and I love the Braves. We love the Braves. And we can now go to the Braves games even quicker and easier thanks to our friends at Game Time. Last-minute deals. You can save up to 60% buying last-minute for sports, concerts, comedy, the theater, and more. They've got all in pricing, the toggling feature. It allows you to show the, you see the total up front, not just like, okay, it's this. And then you go to check out, it's like $40 more. They actually combine all of that. So you actually know what you're paying. You don't have to worry about how many fee, how much fees are going to be added after the fact. So I use game time personally. I strongly recommend you do the same as well. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again, create an account or redeem code locked on college for $20 off. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Lindsay, more time goes by. And it's like Cam Coleman is evolving every single practice. <laughs> and look, I was uh, we were all early on this. And it's so I'm sure to like listeners, and, and you know, I have I have some neighbors. We were doing some Easter stuff. Sunday afternoon with our kiddos doing Easter egg hunts and all that. And, you know, some of the neighbors that listen to the show and check out the show, it's like, so, so really, like, who's impressing you this spring? Who are you hearing from this spring? And it's like, nobody can quit talking to me about Cam Coleman. Nobody. Nobody. I don't care if it's players. I don't care if it's coaches. I don't care if it's support staff. I don't care if it's players' parents that are invited to some of these practices. Everybody I talk to, and most of it's unsolicited. They're like, this Cam Coleman guy, Zach, it's insane. And it's like, I get it. I get it. And now you're starting to see other Auburn media just totally gas the guy up, which he's deserving of it. And fans that watch and listen, to the everydayers on this show, you'll probably roll your eyes at me a little bit because I can't, I can't do a show without a segment being dedicated to Cam Coleman. But I'm just telling you, the first time you guys get to see him at A-Day, you're going to get it. You're about, oh. This guy is different. And to me, like early on in, in practice, like the physical stuff was there. And it, it sounded like it took him a little bit to uh, kind of learn the patterns and the plays and all that, which is normal, right? Yeah. He was in high school five minutes ago. But he seems to be putting it all together, Lindsay. And it sounds like Peyton Thorne threw five or six passes to him. I think all of his passes or all of his completions were from Peyton Thorne this past Saturday. I had somebody tell me that. So, uh, Cam Coleman or bust as far as the wide receivers go. I, I, he's special. He's going to be special day one, and he has a chance to be the best receiver Auburn's ever had. There's a couple common themes that I've heard about Cam Coleman when I, I kind of, I read stuff, I listen to stuff. I, people send, you know, not as many, much as you, but people send me, you know, tweets or DMs or whatever. And yeah. it's one, he's listed at 6'3", 188, and he looks significantly bigger when you stand next to him. He is... Like there, there are some people that 
they're listed at 6'3", and you're like, okay, they're gassing him up a little bit. He's six one and a half. Shout out to our friend Ryan Bliss. He was listed at 5'9 forever. And that short, short, that short king is 5'6", all day long. But Cam <laughs> Coleman is bigger than like he's listed. Yeah. And he plays that big. And right. the number of, of people that have mentioned just how quickly he can flip his hips and get upfield. And he it's we started talking about catch radius again. Like I remember uh, watching Calvin Johnson at Georgia Tech. And I am not comparing these two players just right up front. But I remember watching Calvin Johnson at Georgia Tech. And the conversation there was if you can get the ball into his catch radius, if he can get one hand to wherever the ball is, he's coming down with it. And a lot of the conversation I've heard about for Cam Coleman is exactly the same. That ball might be behind him and he has to flip around in the in midair. But if he can get one hand on it, he's going to bring it in. And I, it, it sounds hyperbolic, but I can't remember a time when we've had a wide receiver that was this physically gifted and seemed to get it as far as the playbook, uh, football IQ, and the effort on every single play because we've had super talented receivers we've had super hard working receivers we've never had that guy that was the absolute complete package it feels like until right now yeah yeah i think he is the complete package and the big question has been okay sure coleman can become that guy but how long is it going to take and it may be quicker than we all realized i mean i can't wait to see him kind of go full gas um in a day i because you know they're going to draw some stuff up for him. Oh, yeah. You know that's going to happen. But I just think, I mean, from a personality standpoint, I've interviewed him once. He came on the show a few weeks ago, and then he was made available to the local media last week. I think. Oh, so so you got him before the local media did? Okay. Just OTV's like, who do you want on your show? And I'm nice like, flex. I want Cam Coleman. <laughs> nice flex. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah, but... I mean, he seems pretty like nonchalant as far as like personality goes. Mm -hmm. And then I think he's just one of those guys when he puts the helmet on and it's time to go, it's like something, something switches. And so I'm all for it. I'm all for Cam Coleman. I I'm also hearing good things about Robert Lewis. They've been yeah. a little mixed mm -hmm. as far as review, but mostly positive. Some saying he's got a ways to go, which is fine too. This is a guy who's adjusting his game from, you know, Georgia State to, to here. That's going to take some time, too. And then I actually haven't heard anything else good outside of that. Some <laughs> some Caleb Burton. Right. I think Caleb Burton's probably the most under-discussed wide receiver in this room. Part of that is my fault. I don't think I'm helping with that solution. But I think it's those three guys, and I think there's a little bit of a drop-off, Lindsay. And then that's where the conversation of the transfer portal, and then obviously Perry Thompson coming in as well over the summer. I think that's where it gets really interesting. Yeah, and I would expect adjustment periods for some of those guys. I do think Mal uh, uh, Burton's probably your number one receiver right now, if not for the whole uh, Cam Coleman existing thing, right? Because he's a guy incredibly talented, was really well regarded in, in recruiting. Yeah. Anytime a guy goes to Ohio State and Brian Hartline, you have to assume he's got some sort of raw ability there to be a, a, a top tier wide receiver. Sure. And Another situation where he had quarterback play that was probably different than he was expecting last year. You're now into a new playbook and everything. I'm still a believer. I still think he's going to play a big role this year, especially depending on how long it takes if they had a transfer portal guy uh, or Perry Thompson to, yeah. to get up to speed and having not been here for spring. Still think that the ceiling of this team is much better with him than without him, but it does feel like you're going to kind of have to base everything around running backs, Rivaldo Fairweather and Cam Coleman, at least early, while you figure out what these other guys, who's going to step up and take a spot, whereas Cam Coleman has already stepped up and taken his spot. Yeah, and I think Peyton Thorne has figured out a way to to mesh with him, which is which is huge, which is important. That timing of rapport. Is the so, chemistry, yes. Yeah, it's an underrated part of this for sure. So, is Auburn baseball okay? One and eight to start SEC play. You shouldn't panic yet. And we tell you why in just a moment, right here on Locked on Auburn. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Amazon Fire TV. Lindsay, let me ask you a very simple question. 
Can you imagine watching TV in any other form other than Amazon Fire TV? I cannot. Would never do it. It's how, why? Makes me angry to think about it, that people don't do that. It's wild to me. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers an amazing viewing experience with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick. Yeah, you can't even like use the excuse of like, I don't have a smart TV. It's like, well, just get a, get a Fire stick. They're very affordable. Plug it into your TV and then boom, you have a smart TV. There's no excuses here, people. There's no excuses. I like pulled up. They've got, uh, fa what are they calling them? Fire TV channels. Mm -hmm. I actually watched opening day games last week. I watched the Yankees and the, who did the Yankees play? Wasn't the Astros. It was the Astros. I think they played the Astros. But I watched that game, like, for free on their, like, on the Fire TV uh, channel there. So they've got all sorts of stuff, including Locked On Sports Today. We've got a, we have a Fire TV channel as well. So check it all out. It's great. If you haven't checked them out, you should. Trust me. To learn more, go to Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. Lindsay, the Auburn baseball team did not do well in College Station. It was another sweep. And so their first three series, their first nine games in SEC play, they have won just one of them. I believe it was game three in Arkansas when they hosted the number one team in college baseball. Several close calls. Yep. They're in most of these games. It just hasn't really turned out the way that it needed to go. You predicted this. You said that this was a very real possibility. And you said, hey, when it does, don't freak out about it yet. And so why should we not freak out about it yet, Lindsay? Okay, so uh, one, road teams in the SEC are having a really tough time this year. And a lot of baseball knowers I've talked to don't really understand why home teams are winning at almost a 700 clip this year. Uh, this college baseball season and the teams that, that that have won on the road is mostly just Kentucky. <laughs> They're mostly the only ones who have won on the road. Uh, and you can see even other really good teams are still in a bad place because of the way the schedule's broken down. We're one and eight. LSU is two and seven because we had at Vandy, number one Arkansas at home, and then at Texas A&M, top five team, right? Uh, you look at LSU, at Mississippi State, they won one of three. Uh, home versus top 10 Florida, they won one of three. They went to Arkansas and got swept. So they got swept by number one Arkansas. We won one against number one Arkansas. I was talking to a bunch of people from D1Baseball.com over the weekend, because I same questions, right? Like, is it right to be panicked? Am I just thinking about this differently because I'm here, right? Yeah, are you bugging a little yeah, bit? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, like, am I biased because I know and love Butch Thompson? Well, one, they know and love Butch Thompson too. We all do. How could you uh, not? Right. Exactly. But the consensus of everybody that I've talked to, whether, I mean, it, it, it's every single person that I've discussed this is like, yes, it's one in seven. It's wild that Auburn is, one in eight, sorry. Wild that Auburn is rated, it's one in eight in conference. It blows everybody's mind. Yeah. But, They've come really close, like you said, a lot of times. Two of those three yeah. Arkansas games were one-run games. Uh, and, and Texas A&M, extra innings. I mean, they've come really close. And it all kind of comes back to the expectation was that pitching was going to be a strength for this team. You were bringing back like 80% of your innings this season. Yeah. Um, for some reason that hasn't really manifested in the way that we thought it would. Joseph Gonzalez no. has not been the guy that we thought he was going to be, the guy that he was in 2021 yeah. or 2022. Sorry, 22, 21 or 22, like 22, was not the guy that we thought he was going to be. Uh, you've seen Chase Alsup has been fighting very well, but has gotten in holes early in games, and you've kind of been moving guys, cycling guys through that number three spot. So... Right. I, I mentioned it, I feel like, every single year, and the consensus from everybody that I've talked to this weekend is Auburn is still going to go on a run. They always go on a run, right? Back half of the schedule, look at last year. They go from not even potentially not even making the field of 64 to hosting a regional on the back half. 
Yeah. This year feels a lot like that. In 2019, Auburn was 14 and 16 in conference and went to Omaha. The question that everybody's asking that I've talked to about this, they're confident Auburn's going to go on a run once you figure out the roles, once you figure out who needs to be pitching what innings, who needs to be starting, all of that stuff. The question is, one, how soon until that happens? Because yeah. you've got Tennessee this weekend, which is another not easy matchup. Because you know, And then I mentioned the only team that really seems to win on the road is Kentucky. They come to Auburn in two weeks. So you get them at home, and then you have to go to state and to LSU. So the schedule doesn't really get that much easier. But it, it's slightly easier, but not... You're just not three number one the top ten teams in the country, right? Right. Uh, so the question is, when does that run start, and is it going to be enough to get you into the field of sixty four? The belief is, yes, a spot is absolutely still in play. Right. What's the ceiling? Right. Is the ceiling hosting a regional? Is the ceiling a two seed? What is this? But all of the bait, the ball knowers, the baseball knowers that I that I know to and talk to have all said they are confident it is not over for Auburn. This season still has plenty of time left. It's just a question of how long does it take for it to click. Yeah, so UAB Tuesday. Tomorrow, uh, that, that'll be up in Birmingham, Regions Field. Then Auburn hosts Tennessee this weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday series in Plainsman Park. What's your confidence level here, Lindsay? Tennessee, not a bad group. Tennessee, not a bad group. I do have some questions about their ability to get through an entire weekend on the mound. I okay. do think this is something Auburn's offense is going to have to step up. We've seen them score plenty of runs. We've seen uh, Ike Irish, Cooper McMurray obviously have been machines. Chris Stanfield's turned it on recently after kind of being a little slow in the back half of non-conference play. Right. You've just got to see more consistency and you've got to be able to pick up this pitching staff while they figure it out. I feel like a uh, two in one weekend is entirely possible. I'd love a sweep. I'm never going to predict a sweep for the most part because of, I mean, you've seen how things have gone every single yeah. year, but two and one is entirely possible this weekend against Tennessee. Yeah. I think that ignites something. And then, like you said, they'll host Kentucky the following weekend. And if you can kind of get back to back uh, series wins, I mean, you're, you're back in it. You're back yep. in it. So, Lindsay, how can people check out everything you've got going on? I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. It's the hub for everything. If you're looking for baseball content, uh, Atlanta Braves, Bravestoday.com. We've also got Marlins writing as well and Auburn Baseball, AuburnDaily.com. Yep, you can find it all there. You can uh, find me on socials at Z Blackerby. Read all my written work at AuburnDaily.com. And please like the video, subscribe to the channel. We'll see you tomorrow. This has been Locked on Auburn.